our lives will be accountable according to how we treat the poor, the weak, and how we treat those people who are less fortunate. All of those things is a direct reflection of our relationship with God. There's a second thing that we need to understand. So according to how we lived our lives on earth, someday when we stand before God, we will be judged. But it's another thing that we need to understand is this. This passage, it does not mean that if we are nice to people, we're going to heaven, and if we're mean to people, we're going to hell. No. What this passage says to us is this. Our relationship with God directly reflects how we treat those who are less fortunate. It tells us, it teaches us, that if we truly love God, if we're in a right relationship with God, it directly reflects how we love and how we see people who are less fortunate. It's sort of like saying this. It's like man and woman getting married. And a wife says to the husband, you know, I love you, honey. I love you and I will marry you. But don't expect me to take care of you when you're sick or be with you when you're old. And don't expect me to take care of our children either. I mean, a statement like that is unheard of. But when we say, God, I love you, I want to be in a right relationship with you, but, you know, at the same time, please don't ask me to help the poor, uh, you know, look after the neglected, and take care of the sick. I don't want to do that. That's just not possible. Because our relationship with God is directly reflected in our relationship with others. Again, it's like a husband telling your wife, you know, I'll marry you, but, you know, we'll live together, I'll marry you, but don't expect me to make money and give you, you know, share my, you know, whatever I make with you. Don't expect me to come home and, you know, fix up the house or do housework. Don't expect any of those things. And don't expect me to come home and, and play with the children. Again, it is unheard of. That is not marriage. That is not a relationship. And the same principle is applied through this passage that, that's given to us. When we love God, we will love those who are less fortunate. We will love those. We will care for those who are hurting. We will care for those who are sick. This passage gives us an idea of how we are to live our lives as Christians. You know, in the past, I've told this, I've said these things many times to my students, especially during the time, uh, Christmas, especially during Christmas time. I would always ask people, you know, even this morning, I asked my daughter, uh, you know, whose birthday is it, whose birthday is Christmas? Or whose birthday are we celebrating on Christmas? And to be honest with you, my daughter Faith, she thought she didn't understand the question. She didn't understand. So let me ask you today, uh, whose birthday are we celebrating on Christmas? It's Jesus Christ. We're celebrating Jesus' Jesus's birth on Christmas. That's what we're doing. But then my question, next question is this. Then why are we sharing gifts to one another when we're celebrating Jesus' birthday. Again, this is a very funny thing that we're doing. It's sort of like, you know, Damien, you know, tomorrow is your birthday, or today is your birthday. So you know what? Lucy, you should buy a present for me. And then if it's a really nice gift, I'll buy one for you too. It makes total, it, may, it doesn't make sense at all. If it's Damien's birthday, we should honor him and celebrate his birth. Again, Christmas is a celebration of birth of Jesus Christ. And yet we spend so much of our time celebrating it by giving our presents to one another, and we neglect Jesus Christ. So I share this with my students, and I share this with my children. So on Christmas, really, we should not be buying presents for one another. Instead, we should be thinking about buying a gift for Jesus Christ. Because after all, we are celebrating his birthday. Right? Amen? Amen? Okay, then my next question is this. Then what should we buy for Jesus? What, should we, what kind of a present should we get for Jesus? You know, this is not an easy question, really. Because, you know, right now, actually, uh, you know, my mother's here, and, my, you know, I asked my mother, too. And uh, when my mother's here, I asked her, Mom, you know, what do you want for Christmas? And even before I asked, I know the answer. The answer is she doesn't want anything for present as a Christmas present. Instead, she wants money. <laughs> the reason being is there's nothing that my mother does not have or is lacking. She already has everything. 
So I know for me, during, you know, when, uh, during my mother's you know, birthday, one of, the harder, one of the harder things for me to do is to figure out what to get her. Because what do you get for someone that has everything? Right? And same thing for Jesus Christ. What do you get? What kind of a gift do you get for God? I mean, He is God after all. You know, if He wants anything, with the snap of His finger, I mean, he, with, the, with the snap of His finger, He created the universe. With His breath, He gave life, you know. I mean, what do you get? <laughs> what do you give to a God? I mean, that's a very difficult question. And to be honest with you, I thought about that. God, this is your birthday. I want to honor you. I want to celebrate you. And I want to give to you what you want. And I thought about it for a while. And I struggled with that. But in the end, I, under, I knew what I needed to give to God. I need to give to God what, what He wants. I need to give to Him what He likes. And I discovered that on Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 to 46. Again, let me read to you some of the passages. It says here, on that day when we stand before God in judgment, He said God's going to separate the good ones to the left and the bad ones to the right. I'm just paraphrasing. The ones that, that obey God and had a relationship with God, God said, okay, I want you to stand over here. But those of you who did not know me and those of you who did not have a relationship with me, I want you to stand right over here. He's going to separate on that day of judgment. And on that day, you know, God's going to say, you know, you are standing here because through your life, I can tell that you truly love me and that you are my child. And people are going to say, really? How can you tell? And God's going to say, you know, remember when I was hungry, you fed me? Do you remember when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink? You remember when I was a stranger to you, you invited me into your home? And when I didn't have any clothes, you gave me clothes? And when I was sick, you cared for me. Don't you remember? And then people go, excuse me, God. You know, I, you know, I remember doing those things, but I don't ever remember doing it to you. And God's response was this. Remember when you did these things to least of my children? Do you remember when years ago, when you're walking down the street and when you saw somebody that was cold, you took off your jacket and gave it to him? That was me that you did it to. Do you remember one day you were watching television and you saw this person, you saw these children in Africa and they were starving and your heart was moved so you decided to donate a lot of money for them? You know, you didn't just do it to them. You were doing it unto me. Remember when, when, you're, you know, when your friends at the dormitory, when they were sick, when everyone was out, you know, going to school, going to class and, and doing their own thing, you decided, you know, I'm going to stay behind and take care of my friend? Well, you were doing it to me. See, this passage tells us what God wants. And this passage tells us the things that we can do to make God happy. Things that we can really directly, things that we can do that will directly affect God. That directly touch it. That directly touch God. So what does Jesus want for Christmas? There are three things from this passage that I want to share with you. What Jesus wants. What Jesus wants for Christmas. Number one. For Christmas, Jesus wants us to feed the poor and the hungry. This is what Jesus wants for Christmas. For us to feed the poor and the hungry. You know, in our family... For about four years, we sponsored a child. I know, I know that many of you also in this room, you do the same thing. For about four years, my wife and I, we sponsored a child through Compassion International, where every month they, they take out money. They take about, I think, 30-some dollars out of our credit card. And with that money, we're able to, to feed, to clothe, and educate a child. And we did that for about four years. And we recently stopped that, not because we wanted to stop, but we had to change our credit card. And because of it, we couldn't no longer make this arrangement. But we plan on continuing again. But the, one of the main reasons why we did this 
and was because my wife and I one day we I think it was during Christmas time I'm not exactly sure but we realized that you know we should help these people we need to help these children and this is what God wants you see this is what God wants us wants for Christmas for us to feed the uh, poor to feed the hungry and to take care of them second thing God wants for Christmas for his birthday is for us to help the unfortunate. You know, I think one of the reasons why All Nations Community Fellowship, our church, is so liked by so many people is because of this very reason. I think many of you, including myself, we appreciate this ministry and we appreciate this church because the people here, because people of All Nations Community Fellowship, they're so eager in helping those of us who are strangers to this land. And even though I look Korean, I am a stranger also to this land. I know that speaking to many of the past members from All Nations Community Fellowship, and there have been many because, you know, people that come to our church, you know, many of them stay for about a year. They come here for their research. They come here for uh, different studies, and they go back. And whenever they go back, and they oftentimes send me email. In fact, I received one also this past week. And they often, often almost... In fact, almost every time, they always mention the fact that how the members of this church really helped them in their time of need. How the member of this church helped them just little things like you know, going to grocery store to buy things, to giving them a ride to buy things, even taking, you know, making arrangements for t- their child's education. When they needed something, when they needed to go visit the hospital, you know, our church member helped. All these little things that many of us struggle with because of language, The members of All Nations Community Fellowship help with that. And this is the type of action that God wants from us. This is the type of thing that God says, this is what I want you to do for Christmas. Because whatever you do for the least of my brothers and sisters, God says, you're doing it unto me. So what does God want for Christmas? Number one, for us to feed the poor and the hungry. Number two, for us to help those who are less fortunate. And it doesn't mean that they're you know, not just poor, not just, have, you know, not just about having less money, but people like myself, you know, who does not know this country, who is not really that comfortable with the language. In fact, when I came here, you know, many of the members here helped me with furni- buying, you know, gathering furniture, getting an apartment. You know, for me, I, don't, I have no idea how to even rent an apartment in Korea. And these are the things God says, This is what I want for Christmas. And lastly, what does God want for his birthday? God wants us to be generous. God wants us to be generous to strangers. You know, we live in a society where we put up a barrier between ourselves and others, and we're often hesitant to interact and help those that we are not familiar with. You know, for my you know, on a personal level, you know, for the longest time, you know, I used, I, I used to refuse help, help, I used to, uh, I refused to help those uh, who are beggars on the street. In the city of Houston, uh, you know, if you drive around and usually uh, underneath the bridge, underpass, when you, go under, when you go underneath the underpass, oftentimes you will find beggars there. They're there because it gives them protection from the heat. It gives them a little shade. And it gives them a little bit of protection from other, uh, uh, I guess, say, the harms of nature, you know, wind, rain, and, and, and so forth. And uh, whenever you stop at a traffic light, you know, a beggar, you know, you, you know people would hold up signs says, you know, hungry, you know, need food, you know, please help, you know, God bless you. And they would hold up a sign asking us to donate some money. And for the longest time, I refused to give them money. And the reason for that was, you know, you know, and I used to kind of, you know, rash, you know uh, rationalize in my mind that if I help these poor people, if I help these beggars, uh, they're going to take this money and they're going to go buy alcohol. And they're going to spend this money in buying more drugs. So by helping them, I'm actually helping them to harm themselves. And that was the kind of rationale that I had uh, that kind of justified me not helping them. But then one day, uh, I was talking to a church member, and he really convicted my heart. 
I don't know how, but we, we began to talk about these homeless people that I encountered. And then, I, you know, we talked about, actually his name is Songa. He's really, a, his name is uh, Titus. And uh, we talked about it, and, you know, I said, uh, you know, I was really ashamed, actually, after this conversation. I said, you know, I, I, I don't give them money because I know that if I give them money, you know, some of these people, they'll, they're not going to spend it on food, but they're going to go immediately go to a liquor store and, and buy more, more alcohol. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to give them money. And I told him, you know, sometimes I hear about these beggars that they're actually, they're very wealthy because they make so much money from begging that, that they actually, they, they refuse to get a job because they actually make more money from begging. And, you know, I heard on the news that, you know, they follow this one beggar and after a day's worth of begging, he goes to a nice home, to a nice family. And I say, you know, they're, they're, they don't really need my money. You know, I kind of shared, you know, these things to uh, Titus. And Titus, you know, I'm a pastor, you know, and he's, a, he's much younger than me. He, he kind of nodded and says, you know, you know, Pastor Paul, you know, I guess you're right, you're right, you know. But then he went on to say, and he was not trying to uh, correct me or, or, you know, make me feel guilty, but he goes like, yeah, maybe. So uh, maybe, I mean, you're right and, you know, you could be right in a lot of those things. So he said, so because, and I agree to a certain degree. So this is what I decided to do. And Titus said, you know, when I see them, you know, I really feel like God's telling me to help them. You know, I, I really just cannot just walk by, you know, when they're asking because they could really, some of them, maybe they're really hungry. So he said, you know, so what I decided to do was every morning when I leave home, I decided to pack about five, six bags of lunch. In America, in Korea, I don't know how things are done, but in America, uh, when people go, go to work, you know, if they want to save money, they take food, they take sandwiches, maybe put an apple or a drink, and they put it in a little brown paper bag. So you call it a brown bag or a paper bag lunch. So he said, you know, you know, like you, you know, I feel hesitant to give them money because I'm not sure. So because of it, I decided to pack lunch for them. So every morning when I leave, I know that I'll be passing by, uh, you know, Fairbanks and Beltway 8. And I know that I'm going to see some beggars there. So I decided to pack some lunch, make some sandwich on my own, and put an apple and, and a bottle of water. So when I pass by, when they're begging for money, I just roll down my window, and I give them a bag, uh, a bag of lunch. When he shared that story with me, I mean, I was really, I was ashamed. <clears throat> As a Christian and as a pastor, we make so many excuses. We, we, have, we try to come up with so many reasons to justify not doing this and not doing that. We come up with so many reasons to justify not helping the poor and not giving to the needy. And those reasons are really legitimate because my reasoning was legitimate. Too often we say we're so busy. Too often we say, you know what, I give to the church. And I've used that line many times. And I do give to the church. I donate money to Compassion International. I donate money to the church. And through the church, I've done many other activities to help the poor and the needy. And some say, you know, I'm just too busy to do this. I'm too busy to help, you know, feed the poor. And you're right. We're right. We are busy. But the thing that God really convicted me was this. When I read this passage, when I studied it and when I meditated on it, I could not help but think. When I stand before God on that day in judgment, and God said, Paul, okay, you know, you can stand over here because, you know, you have given your life to me. But you're not going to get as much reward as others. And the reason for that is this. Because Paul, when I was hungry, you did not, give me, you did not feed me. When I was cold, you did not give me any clothes. When I was sick, you didn't care for me. And then I envisioned myself telling God, God, I mean, when? When did I do that? I mean, I don't ever remember not doing it to you. I've done this and that and that. And I just envisioned myself, God saying this to me, Paul, remember that day 
the man that was standing on the intersection of 290 and Fairbanks. And he said, you know, homeless, out of work, need food. Even though you had a bunch of change in your wallet, you have some money in your pocket, and yet you totally ignored and avoided me. That was me you ignored. Remember the disabled man on his wheelchair? They were sitting, you know, disabled veteran cannot work. Please, you know, donate whatever you can. You just totally ignored him, thinking in your heart that this person is not that, you know, bad, you know, it's not that bad and he doesn't need the money. Well, the person they ignored was me. After this incident and meditating on this passage, I mean, I really felt ashamed. I think too often as Christians, we rationalize too often about helping people instead of simply giving out of obedience. So from that moment, this is a commitment. Well, I, I, you know, I wish I can say that I made brown bag lunch every day. I didn't. But this is what I did do. Whenever I came across, really, interact, and somebody came to me and said, I'm hungry. Instead of, you know, I still didn't give them money. But what I did was this. I said, are you really hungry? They said, yes. And I said, follow me. Actually, I didn't even ask them, are you really hungry? I said, you're hungry? They said, yes. Okay, then please follow me. And no matter how busy I was, I would take them to the local fast food, McDonald's or Burger King, and I would actually buy them food. And I realized, and in my mind, I would always say to myself, and I would think to myself, you know, this is Jesus that I'm helping. And this is what Jesus wants for me. Why do I do this? Because this is what God wants for his birthday. And this is how I can give to God on his birthday. Because the Bible tells us that whatever we do to the least of our brothers and sisters is just like doing it unto him. And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it unto the least of my brothers and sisters, you're doing it unto me. And he will answer, I tell you the truth, when you refuse to help the least of these my brothers and sisters, you are refusing to help me. So you see, when I see people in need, people that are elderly, people who are begging, begging for money, you know, I try not to even think about how they're going to use the money. Because when I start thinking about that, all my desire to help them, it disappears. So I try not to think about that. Instead, I just focus on the fact that, you know, you know, I will never know for sure whether they truly need my money or not. And I'm not even going to rationalize. I'm just going to choose to give. And I see it as an opportunity to give to God. In 12 days, I think, 12 days, Christmas is coming. It's Jesus' birthday. If you're like me, I think you've already, you're done with your Christmas shopping. I am. Uh, Esther and I, we haven't bought each other gifts. We made a decision a long time ago not to buy each other gifts on Christmas, but instead save their money and give to God. But, you know, children are different. They're young. They don't fully understand that. So I've already bought my gift for my children, and so forth. And it's all done. But for this Christmas, I want to make a challenge to all of you. And the challenge is this. I want you guys to think about someone. I want you to pray and think about someone that might have a need. I want you to think and pray about someone that you know that might be struggling. And maybe on this Christmas... Think about helping those people who are in need. In fact, when we're staying in America, and we've been away from church ministry, and I, I hate to say this, but when we're in America, my wife and I, when we made this decision, we said, you know, during every Christmas, let's really think and pray about someone those that we can help. And just to share some example with you, I remember one Christmas, during one Christmas, we prayed. I said, God... Please lead us to someone whom we can help, poor and the needy that needs our help. And I remember, you know, during one Christmas, one of our church members, uh, well, a father, he was diagnosed with cancer and he was dying. And we felt 
And uh, we prayed about it, and without, you know, and we decided to give to this person $500. And we felt, we really, in our heart, we felt bad because we wanted to give more money. And I remember another Christmas season, there was another family who had lost their job, whose business had failed, and they were struggling from month to month, even just to feed themselves. And, you know, nobody really likes charity or to receive charity. So I remember one day we put, you know, another, again, $500 in an envelope, anonymous, and we just told them, you know, God loves you, just hang in there. And we put it in their church mailbox, and we just left it there for them. And I remember another Christmas we prayed, and, and I remember one of the students were, you know, at our church were struggling with finance for even just paying the tuition. And anonymously, again, we decided to give to him and support him and so forth. And the reason why we made a decision to do that was because Christmas is not our birthday. Christmas is Jesus' birthday. And we realized that the best way to give to him is by taking care of those who are poor, who are needy, who are sick. And after all, it is Jesus' birthday. So on this Christmas, it's about 12 days to go. I want to challenge all of you to think about that. Let's give to Jesus on his birthday what he wants. And the second thing that I want to challenge you is this. For those of you who have children, <clears throat> you know, there's no, there's no value in teaching our children to become great men and women of God. We spend thousands of dollars in trying to educate them in English and math and try to bring their grades up. But I think one of the best investments that we can make is, is to spend money in teaching our children the value of giving and serving God. So if you're a mother and father and if you have children, I want to make a challenge to you. For this Christmas, you know, I know that they always want presents, so you can buy them presents. But on this Christmas season, also tell your, share with your children, you know, for this Christmas season, let's all contribute additional money. And I actually talked about this with my daughter this morning. I said, you know, Faith, why don't you donate a little bit of money, and William can donate some money, and then Mommy and Daddy will donate some money, and with this money during Christmas, let's, you know, let's, you know, give to the poor and, and do what Jesus wants us to do. And again, you know, maybe all children are like this, but I was just so proud. You know, yesterday, you know, Faith and William and I, we went to Seoul because um, it was my aunt's birthday. And since my mother was in town, we went to Seoul. And whenever they go, go to, uh, you know, a gathering with lots of uncles and aunts, they always get, you know, spending money. So actually, my children uh, yesterday received about 35000 <laughs> from all the aunts and uncle. <clears throat> and this morning they were counting money and so forth. And that's why I was reminded of that. So I told my, I, I asked my daughter, you know, Faith, let's do that. Why don't we give some money, you know, and help the poor. And Faith just looks at her money and she just takes out 30,000, three 10,001 bill and says, do you want me to give all of them? As if it was not even an issue. And I said, you know, and my wife said, you know, I want you to just think about it first. Think about how much you want to give. So this Christmas, Mommy and Daddy and William and Faith, we're all going to contribute money together to give to the poor. Because after all, it's Jesus' birthday. So on this Christmas season, if you're already doing this, you know, praise God and I commend you. If not, let's do something different. Let's think and pray about, you know, giving and celebrating the way God wants us to celebrate. And let's think and pray about maybe there are those of us around here who are much less fortunate than we are. Maybe give to them, because giving to them, the Bible says, is giving to God. And on this Christmas, what better way to teach our children the right value to become great men and women of God? What can be better than to teach them at a young age to give to help those who are less fortunate? And lastly, let's not make this a one-time deal. But instead, let's make this a habit where every Christmas we celebrate his birthday by giving to the poor, helping the needy, and taking care of those who are sick.
Because again, why? Because by feeding and loving and helping the least is feeding and loving and helping our God. That's what he wants for his birthday. Let us pray.